And it is my pleasure today to also welcome Susan House, who is a College of Arts and Sciences excellent professor and head of the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology in the College of Arts and Sciences. Before joining the volunteer family in 2015, Dr. Callis was a professor in uh, the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh. She received her PhD in biology at the University of Chicago, and in the years following, she collected a variety of experiences, including a research associate in bot botany at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, a sabbatical scholar at the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center at Duke University, and program director in the Division of Environmental Biology at the National Science Foundation, where each year she administered eight grant panels of 25 science scientists per panel, evaluated more than 800 proposals, awarded grants to principal investigators, and managed spreadsheets and budgets. So it's no wonder that she was such a great get for the College of Arts and Sciences. And we're happy to have her here today to present to us the role of species interaction in the forest invasion the good, the bad, and the ungulate. Sarah. Susan. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. And, and for the Clint Eastwood fans, I hope you catch this. All right, so I'm going to see if this will work. Um, I want to start out, first of all, by thanking lots of people who have participated in my lab, I, um, graduate students, postdocs, and especially squads and squads of undergraduates who helped collect data on 15,000 individually tagged plants for one of some of the experiments that we'll be talking about. So we've been following these plants for over 17 years and we have very detailed demographic data which I will show to you later. Okay, so as Amanda said, I'm, I'm a recent uh, person at UT and one of the things that's really amazing about this area is that UT is embedded in this beautiful landscape of wild lands and, and other kinds of lands, managed lands. And it's really uh, quite a fabulous place to be. The forests are spectacular. Uh, it's famous for its understory and overstory plants, beautiful water. The, um, there are 130 species of trees in the national park. And that's more than the number of species of trees in all of Europe. There are 3,500 species of plants in the Smoky Mountains National Park, so there's a lot of biodiversity here. And it's really a draw, I'm sure, for all of you, for tourists and for ecosystem function, that having this uh, set of species that work together to deal um, with our lives. There are um, amazing mussels that are uh, throughout all of the waters here. In fact, it's one of the most biodiverse areas for mussels. We have uh, a biodiversity hotspot for salamanders, 35 species of salamanders, 24 species of lungless salamanders. It's really a biodiversity hotspot for plants, for animals, for all sorts of things. And I just want to put a little pitch in for the hard work that people in my department have done to look at biodiversity here. You can find these books uh, about biodiversity in our region. Can you see? Am I standing in the way? Okay. Um, that have been published by UTK scientists. So we are really proud of the work that's being done in our department. And there are more. Here are just some. They're dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to give you a little overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I have a lot of slides, but I'm going to just sort of go quickly and I'm not going to belabor the analyses but just the, the messages. So I want to talk a little bit about forest biodiversity, why we're starting to see an a overabundance of deer, how these um, kinds of overabundant deer interact with the native species and invasive species to change what's going on in our forests, um, looking at a specific, oh, I guess I can use this, um, mechanism that some species, some invasive plant species have that disrupt mutualisms, and then just a little bit about management for more uh, biodiverse and sort of maintaining ecosystem function and the beauty that we all love. Okay, so I work on species that are in the understory. I work primarily with herbaceous understory species, um, and as I said, they're 3,500 uh, species of plants 
in this region. And if you look at the um, basically any forest, the functional group, like what, if you think of like herbaceous species or trees or woody species, the group that is most biodiverse are these um, herbs in the understory. So the, this is overstory species richness versus understory, and we, the understory beats them, beats the overstory. And you, you know, that probably makes sense. When you look at an understory, you can see how biodiverse they are. And when you go out in the spring on, on wildflower walks and things, you can see just dazzling arrays of plants. And these, their leaves feed animals, their pollen feed pollinators, their nectar feed pollinators, their seeds feed larger animals. They're, they're the foundation of the, of the ecosystem processes that we all uh, think of and rely on. And so these beautiful plants support insects, they support the birds, they support the mammals, and this whole set of species really work together in, when we think about a forest, it's all of these species together with the trees, um, like the book, <laughs> the overstory, um, that create what we think of as the forest. We don't think of it as sort of broken into pieces. And so the understory, this herbaceous layer, not only has the highest biodiversity, but often it contains these rare species because it's really biodiverse. It supports diversity at these other trophic levels, the species that eat each other. And it's generally thought to be this stable, co-evolved community where the interactions between those species are highly evolved, very interdigitated, and highly um, dependent on each other. And one of the interesting things from my perspective and part of my research is that these plants form mycorrhizal networks in the soil that alter the nutrient dynamics of the soil and improve soil conditions. And I'll give you a picture of what that looks like. So just so you understand, it's estimated that about 80% of the forest herbs rely obligately on an association with fungus in their roots to get soil nutrients. And the, the, some of the structures inside the roots look like this. This is called an arbuscule, which looks like a tiny little tree. But if you think back, come on up, there, there are chairs. If you think um, about when you took high school biology and you learned about the alveoli in your lungs, like when you breathe in and those are the sort of highly vascularized parts of your lungs where there's the exchange of oxygen. It's thought that these function in a similar way in the plant root. The plant is giving carbon to the fungus through this alveoli and the fungus is, has these filaments that run through the root and out into the soil through the, through the root, <laughs> inside the root and outside through the root to the outside and mine soil and nutrients for the plant. So there's this exchange going on with carbon going to these AMF fungi and uh, soil nutrients coming to the plant. And these um, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi cannot live outside of the plant. They're not free living. It's a, an obligate mutualistic relationship. So it's super important, and it, we'll come back to this. Um, so if you look at this map, this is a map that was put together by NatureServe of the uh, basically critically imperiled and imperiled species in the United States. And red means highly critically imperiled, like things could happen here is what this means. We have to pay attention. And you can see when you're in a biodiversity hotspot with a lot of uh, things happening in the region, uh, and by happening I mean there's a lot of uh, change going on. There's a lot of potential for these rare species and uh, unusual species to be in trouble. So what are the drivers of biodiversity decline worldwide? Well, the big one is climate change and we've been seeing like this month we've had you know, record rainfalls 
And in, I was telling some people at my table in the north, in Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I have a friend told me that they got seven feet of snow this month. They've never had that before. You know, California is having wildflowers, wildflowers, <laughs> wildfires, and, um, and now they're having rain and snow in LA. I mean, there's just a lot of things that are happening in the climate. We have a lot of forest uh, habitat fragmentation. We are introducing species from around the globe, and then we have what's called trophic downgrading. We're making that the hierarchy of trophic interactions, that is eating who's eating whom, more simplified all, all across the planet. And we'll come back to that one too. So these are data that I'm sure you've seen in this room probably lots of times that the CO2 levels are going up um, across the globe and the temperatures are going up. Uh, oops, I went the wrong way. When I mean uh, habitat fragmentation, it's, I'm talking about this. When you look out of an airplane or you know, go up in Ayers Hall and look out the window, you can see that it's not one uniform kind of habitat. There are farms, there are little, um, oops, I'm pushing the wrong buttons. There are little patches of woods, maybe bigger woods in some areas. There are roads all kinds of, you know, maybe some wild fields. There's a lot of um, structuring of the habitat into types that weren't there originally. And humans are creating this change in the habitat. We have a lot of invasive species. This is a kind of common sight around here to see kudzu. Did that automatically advance? I don't know what happened. Um, and microstegium is another one. This was introduced into, it was first found in Knoxville. It was, a, in 1919, it was a, a plant that was used to ship porcelain from China, and it was used as packing material. And uh, when, so when it arrived and people unpacked it, this, the seeds that were in the dried material germinated and, um, so it's now a really important invasive species, and it started right here. And now we're on to the, the good, the bad, and the ungulate. Um, we also have been seeing that deer populations have been rising steadily over time. So here are uh, maps from 1950, 1970, Oop, shoot. I think it must be on some kind of auto advance, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> trying to rush me, eh? Um, so you can see that in, in Tennessee, we range from low levels to uh, 30 to 45 deer per square mile. That's a lot wow. of deer. That's a lot of deer compared to, look at 1950, like hardly any, any deer here. So. Uh, we, if you think of it from the perspective of a plant, and deer like to eat plants, the amount of browse pressure that is occurring in populations of native plants, and sometimes in people's gardens, and sometimes in their, you know, just in their yards, is phenomenal. The, the number of deer has just skyrocketed in some places. So I grew up in Michigan, and it's, it's super bad there, Wisconsin is, on fire with deer, and it causes all kinds of other issues like chronic wasting disease and other things that are really um, sad for the deer. So this is a real thing, and I went to the, the Smoky Mountains website to see what they said about it, and they said, well, you know, there are deer here, and some places they're more common than others, but they can go up in numbers really dramatically, and they, when they run out of their preferred food, they start eating things that they don't normally eat, and then they start eating things like rhododendron and poison ivy, and then, you know, so they're sort of getting it out very subtly that this is an issue that's starting to come up in the park. So why are deer increasing? So they love this habitat fragmentation that we have made. We create all these edges, and deer are sort of edge species, so they like to go between the forest and the field. They are really adaptable, 
And in areas that are uh, more urban or suburban, you can't hunt. And so they can come into your yard and just snack on your daffodils. I mean, yeah, when I moved from Pittsburgh, I, you know, I lived in the city and there would be deer that would like come into my yard and eat, eat the plants. They're just like, you know, look in the window. They're <laughs> in, in downtown, I mean, there would be deer, herd of deer in downtown Pittsburgh. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so they are, you know, they learn not to be shy because they're no, they know they're not gonna get hit. There's a lot of food availability if you think of forests, agricultural areas, ornamental plants, all these things going together. And these together mean that deer have actually been reproducing at higher rates. So the, the rate of twin births has just become a normal thing because food availability is so high. So instead of just having one Bambi, they have twin Bambis. And there's an absence of predators because, because why? We kill them. We, people don't like to be around predators, and so we kill the predators. And this is that concept of trophic downgrading. So we're like the hyper keystone species. When you think about these trophic um, interactions, you have the top trophic creatures that kind of put pressure all the way down to the bottoms because these guys eat, these guys, these guys eat, these guys, these guys eat, these guys, right? And it happens all the way from the ocean to dry land. And when we think about the kinds of things that the, these trophic interactions that are happening here, our carnivores are wolves or coyotes who would be eating deer who are eating the native plants and garden plants, right? So when the carnivores are eating the herbivores, that has a positive effect on the plants because these guys are not getting eaten as much, not having this negative effect of being eaten by deer. But if you knock out the carnivores, then that has a negative effect on the plant communities and things become depauperate when you have this trophic downgrading. So this is a paper that was published in Science in 2011 that I think everyone should read. It's called Trophic Downgrading of Planet Earth. And it shows uh, for terrestrial systems and aquatic systems when the, uh, when the top predators are absent or present, absent or present. And you can see just visually how more variable or biodiverse these habitats are when there are top predators in the system because they eat the herbivores and the herbivores can't eat up all of the, the plants. And that means that there are more insects, there are more birds, there are more, more all kinds of things. I recommend that you uh, watch the movie How Wolves Changed a River. It's about the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone and how it went from being not very biodiverse to the biodiversity coming back. So this is, this is happening everywhere. Um, and it means that the herbivores, especially ungulates, which are common across the planet, are increasing in numbers. And they have a really strong effect. Also, how many people here have ever been in an accident with a deer or know someone who did? Yeah, <laughs> almost everyone, right? So the number here, we're in the high risk states. One in, uh, oops, one in 147. 47. Yep, going, so I, there's something funny that's going on. So there's a very high likelihood. So one, you know, add 100 more people to this room and one of us is gonna get in an accident with a deer this year. It's a very, um, sobering thing and you know we're hitting deer it's not their fault that there's so many of them we're managing the landscape in a way that causes them to have higher uh, fecundity and larger numbers okay so that's why we have so many deer and what humans are doing and so now i'd like to get a little bit more into the ecology of uh, the work we've been doing and so this looks <laughs> like a crazy lots of arrows and 
things about what I was saying earlier is that species interactions are the heart of understanding ecosystem function and why species are in the assemblages that they are. And so we've been doing long-term experiments where we have deer, native plants that are either palatable or non-palatable, and invasive species, and we look at how these species interact within an experimental context to understand how these mechanisms may influence the maintenance of biodiversity, why we're seeing loss of some species so rapidly, why some seem to be taking a long time to go extinct, why others are robust to some of these pressures. And those are the kinds of things that um, me and my co collaborators and my lab are interested in. So before I moved to uh, Tennessee, I worked in two main areas. Uh, I had study sites around the University of Pittsburgh and around their field station, which is um, just south of Lake Erie in Pennsylvania. <coughs> I'm gonna grab a, I've had the, the same, whatever everyone has had, that cold and flu for a while. I'm good, um, thank you. So one of the study sites is this Trillium Trail Nature Reserve, and the cool thing about it is that we know when deer moved into this area. Deer migrate and they moved in, and so this is a picture taken in 1989 by someone that went there. It was like the place where everyone took their mom and their grandma and mother stayed to like, see the wildflowers, and it was just carpets of wildflowers. And then Sometime in the very early 90s, the deer came in, and this is taken at the same time, and basically they just clear, the deer just eat all the palatable species. They just came in and clear cut it. So that's a, the kind of pressure, this unprecedented herbivory pressure that I was talking about. The plants are not used to that level of, of herbivory. Luckily, Teresa Hines is a neighbor of this area. She's, um, she's, yeah, you guys know ketchup, yeah. So she um, and others were very alarmed at the change in the, in the forest and paid for aerial flyovers to do censuses of deer. And what they found was when they started doing these censuses after the big clear cut of the understory happened is that the, the deer densities went from the historical number of around 10 to uh, as many as 40 per square mile. So it's a lot, or excuse me, square kilometers. So it's been a huge increase there that was really dramatic, which is great for an experimentalist because you know the onset of, an, of a, a pressure, uh, ecological pressure, and you can follow it then. So we set up experimental plots where we had uh, them paired, and one pair, one of the pair, we kept the deer out, and one pair the deer could get in. And so we had deer exclusion and deer access, and we could see what was going on and what kinds of changes the deer were imposing. This is what it looks like. He's our caged undergraduates working in the <laughs> <laughs> in their natural habitat, being those helpers that I showed you before. But these are, these are big, they're 14 meters on a side, they're really big, and this is where we have all the tagged plants. So we have um, three species that are palatable to deer, and two that are not palatable, that are native, a short-lived species, and then this is the invader that we've been paying attention to, it's garlic mustard, Aliaria pediolata. Mm. Did I hear a boo? <laughs> 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 So just to show you the kinds of effects that, that deer can have, just um, between 2003 when we set up these plots and 2008, where deer have access, you can see this little tiny wedge is how many of the plants were flowering for these three species within our plots, a very tiny sliver. But by excluding deer just for five years, about a quarter of the plants had recovered enough to start flowering. And this is what it looks like, right? This is where deer can be, and this is where they're not. And you can see the fence kind of blurry. It's a very dramatic change. So one of the um, great things about um, 
sort of doing population demography is that you can figure out the different stages of a plant, like in this trillium, we, oops, shoot. We um, were able to identify different stages and then we can measure those plants and see the probability that a plant, for example, that's a three-year, a three-leaved non-reproductive individual transitions to become a flowering individual in the next year. And by collecting those kinds of demographic data every year for lots of years, you can fill out all of these arrows and understand whether the populations are growing, whether they're stable, or whether they're declining and they're not stable. One cool thing is that trillium can live an extremely long time. Trillium can live more than 100 years. A lot of, um, yeah, they have these underground rhizomes that just keep adding at the front end. It's very cool. And, and what do you think, I mean, I, I always want people to tell me what's weird about these roots. When you think about like, when no you- hairs. No root hairs. Perfect, you get an eight. Um, <laughs> There are no root hairs, and that's, I think that this is a co-evolved situation where those AMF fungi that are all packed inside of the roots, they don't need to make root hairs because the hyphae are mining the soil, and so they make roots and they don't make root hairs. Does that make sense? Is that what you said makes sense? They outsource. They outsource it, that's right. So just to give you a little hint about what happens. If a, a plant is not eaten and it's reproductive in one year, 81% of the time it remains reproductive the next year. But if, and, and if it's not eaten for two years, it, you know, 76% of the time it remains reproductive. If it gets eaten by a deer, this cuts more than half. And it, instead of remaining reproductive, it shrinks in becomes a three-leaved non-reproductive, or it can go dormant. And if it gets eaten twice, two years in a row, only 18% of them are reproductive. So these plants have one stem, they got three leaves, they get eaten, they can't do any more photosynthesis for that year. And so they are just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking if they keep getting eaten every year. So that's why having extremely high deer populations and deer pressure is not necessarily good. Okay, and when we looked across 12 different sites, when we looked at the average herbivory in a, in a trillium population versus the population growth rate where um, one means that the population is stable, anything more than about 15% of the plants getting eaten means that the populations will decline, trillium populations will decline. And this is a range of herbivory that we saw at Trillium Trail, and this is the mean. So you can see that these plants, these plant populations are experiencing very high pressure that's unprecedented when they used to have just 10 deer per, per square kilometer, and now they're four times that amount. I think they turned the heat up in here, and I think it's getting warm, because it was really cold, and I don't know if, there's, if it's possible to make it not so. I don't know, maybe you guys don't think it's warm. It, it feels warm to me. We're closer to the Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm just still not as healthy as I thought I was. Uh, okay, so, um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about mutualism disruption um, and how, uh, how deer might be facilitating um, invaders, plant invaders. So. There are lots of ideas about why this might be happening. First of all, as I showed you, the deer are just eating a lot of the plants, and so they could be changing the abundance of the plants and making, making uh, competitive opportunities for um, the invaded plants. And they can just be creating physical openings by, re by suppressing how much vegetation is in an area there's just more area for germination and, and uh, growth of invaders. And it's also thought that they may diminish the soil quality, which could negatively affect the plants. And that's mostly because the, by removing the vegetation, 
the leaf litter and other things that would normally accumulate on the forest floor doesn't have any structure to hold it there. So it washes away during rainstorms and it, there are lots of negative ways that um, not having the understory in place means that the soil isn't as functional as it could be. So again, I just want to show you this is like a life cycle of a trillium and this is a life cycle of garlic mustard. It's a biennial, so it germinates, um, forms little rosettes, they overwinter, they flower, and uh, the cycle repeats. So we use these data that we collected in the field uh, in those paired plots to look at um, these life cycle graphs, what I was telling you, being able to put numbers um, to all of these different transitions for trillium and for garlic mustard. And what we found is that in the plots where deer had access, the, the population growth rate, if it's one, it means it's stable. Um, so it's, it's stable, but where deer are excluded, it's actually growing by 20%. So there's like a 16% difference between these two. Um, and when you look at the age structure of the population or the size and stage structure, the pale colors are the younger stages and the darker, more intense colors are the um, flowering stages. You can see where deer have access, we have very few individuals that are flowering. And when we exclude deer, we see that um, we're recovering we're recovering a lot more of the flowering individuals. So we're completing the life cycle in a way that it's not completed where deer have access. And if we look at the lambda at the start of our experiment, so lambda's population growth rate, where deer have access or deer are excluded, um, we see the opposite for garlic mustard. Where deer have access, garlic mustard is doing great and where we've excluded um, deer, the population of garlic mustard is actually below one. So it's pushing the population into decline, which is kind of good, right? <laughs> and the density of garlic mustard is going down in these deer exclusion plots. And we did this fancy analysis and I'm not gonna explain, but when we look at the, each of the transitions that are possible, what we see is when we exclude deer, everything's positive for all these transitions of going from a seed to a seedling, seedling to a one leaf, one leaf to a three leaf. They're all positive for trillium. And when we exclude deer, they're all negative for garlic mustard. So by keeping the deer out, the native flora is recovering and I think um, competing with the, the garlic mustard and suppressing its growth. So the deer are facilitating the invasion of the forest of garlic mustard and may be doing that for other species as well. In fact, they are, but anyway. So eventually you could have a forest that looks like a garlic mustard understory or you can have something that looks more like what, what you expect around here, beautiful wildflowers. So I'm gonna explain a little bit now about the mutualism. So I, I gave you sort of a, a overview a little earlier, but what happens in this uh, nutritional mutualism, the fungi are inside of the roots, they form these hyphal elements that grow out into the soil and expand the area of the soil that the plant can mine for nutrients beyond where the roots are themselves. And the, the mycorrhizal fungi are giving the plant soil nutrients and water and the plant is giving these guys carbon. And so this is part of the plant's um, carbon budget, right? It has to decide 
in quotes, it has to <laughs> allocate some of its limited carbon resources to the mutualist in order to get these um, soil resources. And when it does that, it can come at a cost of growth or reproduction because it's feeding this part of this supply side um, organization <laughs> that it's relying on to get water and nutrients. So remember, somewhere between 70 and 80% of the native plants um, rely on mycorrhizal fundi, and um, even the tree species have mycorrhizal mutualisms that are a little different in type. And so if this mutualism gets disrupted, you can imagine that there will be uh, fitness costs for the plants. So here's a picture, oops, I did it again. Here's a, that arbuscule again, and this is what they look like if you make a section of the root. Um, this is what, what the structures look like. So these arbuscules are uh, these larger structures, these vesicles, and then these are the hyphae that are running through the inside of the root and then poke out to the outside and are in the soil. They're cool. My root's really, <laughs> I really think this is beautiful stuff. Anyway, so the, this, the, here's the, dastardly guy, the garlic mustard, produces a chemical that's produced by a lot of members of the mustard family. It's a glucosinolate. That's why like George Bush didn't like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. It's that thing, that flavor, that kind of bitter flavor that most things in the mustard family have. The reason that the plants make those glucosinolates is to protect themselves from fungi and bacterial diseases. However, if the plant makes enough of those materials and they are uh, leached into the soil, that antifungal property of the glucosinolate can be toxic to a wide range of soil organisms, including AMF and bacteria and other things. So it can, it's doing a great thing for its own fitness, but it can, in a community that it hasn't co-evolved with, can be knocking out beneficial microorganisms. We all know about our, um, our uh, yeah, microbiome, yeah, our own, you know, we know about that we need that and if we take antibiotics, we're a mess. So it's the same kind of thing that if there's something in the, in the community that's killing off these beneficial organisms, then the plants in the community are uh, suffering a hit. So this is like triangle world version of <laughs> explaining that. So here we have the everything's intact and everything's working and the native plant's giving carbon and this hyphae is delivering the goods to the plant. And then we have this invader that comes in with these antifungal compounds that leach into the soil. And so this is kind of knocked back. And if, if this part, the external part of the, of the symbiosis is knocked out, but these internal structures have to be maintained, like the plant's going, okay, I must not be giving enough carbon to my mutualist. I'm gonna put more carbon out there. This mutualism can shift from being beneficial to being a cost or even a parasitic situation. And when that happens, then we would expect to see negative effects on the physiology and growth and carbon storage of the native plant. And that's what we saw. So first of all, we nobody really knew that garlic mustard would release these chemicals into the soil. So we did a lot of experiments. Um, one, of, one of the authors is an undergraduate, one's a, um, a graduate student in my lab at Pittsburgh, and we were able to isolate these glucosinolates from the soil which is a big deal and it was really hard to do. And we were able to show that where garlic mustard grew, there were fewer fungi growing through the soil than um, places where garlic mustard wasn't growing. So it, we had this like, okay, it's the chemicals there, the hyphae's there, not there, or is there, depending on if there's garlic mustard. And we said then, okay, let's see if it has a physiological effect. So we took um, 
these ERGAs, infrared gas analyzers, that measure instantaneous photosynthetic rates of plants in the field and measured them where we, we made what we called toxic tea bags. So we put a screen around some and didn't put garlic mustard leaves in, we put other leaves, or we put leaves of garlic mustard in so that we were leaching the allelo chemical into the soil and we measured um, the photosynthetic rates either in the field or in the greenhouse where we had even more control. And what we found was that the photosynthetic rate when plants were treated with garlic mustard leaves or fungicide, a non-systemic fungicide, so we were just killing the, the hyphae in the soil, had significantly lower photosynthetic rates than a non, non allelopathic um, leaf litter treatment. And we found that for a number of uh, growth metrics, here I'm just showing root mass, that the growth of the plants were suppressed when they didn't have their functional mutualism intact. We also <coughs> found that, um, that the plants that were treated with Aliaria had, um, had more sucrose. They produced, they had significantly higher sucrose levels in their roots and that's the form of the sugar that the plant uses to feed to the microbe, to the AMF. And so what we think is going on is that the plants that are treated with this, their external hyphae are being killed, they're breaking down their storage carbon to sugar, to sucrose, and they're trying to get their AMF to regrow out into the field and sort of it's just this sink, right? They're giving it to it and it just gets killed off by the, by the um, garlic mustard. And we see that the rhizome inulin, that's the storage carbohydrate, is the lowest in garlic mustard treatments. So we've been working to sort of understand the mechanism, but also then scaled up to look at how the plants are doing in the field and found that for Four of, well, three of the plants that um, we've tagged individually so far, that three of the species that are reliant on, on AMF are actually showing population declines when they grow with garlic mustard, even when deer are not present. So garlic mustard in and of itself can have this negative effect that when you compound it with this sort of like the one-two punch of deer plus garlic mustard, um, I think it's a, one of the reasons why we're seeing decline of native species. And when you think about um, the kinds of high temperature summers we've been having and droughts and things like that, when you have this decline in the function of the plant and then uh, diminished capacity to get water and nutrients, that these additional stresses may be what are pushing uh, plants over the edge and into a more uh, less stable population dynamic. So those are the data. And so what you know what can we do? How do we how do we fix some of this stuff? What can we think about? Um, we just one of the things is we need a better management plan for ungulates and wild places to reverse trophic downgrading. Um, one thing you can do is go hunting, because if we're going to kill off our predators, we have to be the top predator. Yeah? It's my understanding that the northern deer <coughs> carry a pathogen mm -hmm. that is toxic to humans, so we can't eat those deer. Right. Some of them. Yep. They have chronic wasting. It's like mad cow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yes, they have to be tested. and uh, any. Department of Natural Resources will test your deer to see if it has it or not. So that kind of eliminates hunting. And well, just yeah. Yeah, it's hard to do. It is hard to do. I mean, so then if you don't want to do that, <laughs> maybe 
we need to work on having more predators and think about the fact that having coyotes and wolves and things like that isn't such a bad idea if we want to preserve function of the whole ecosystem. Are, are they susceptible to the mad cow? Coyotes and wolves? No, not that I know of. But I'm not sure, maybe someone else they here. Are not. They are not, okay, that's okay. Um, you know, places like Pennsylvania, where I moved from, they still plant sorghum and put out cornfields and stuff to encourage deer numbers going up. So that's one of the really hard things is that in the United States of America, each state gets to manage their wild resources indep independently. And so there's no way to have a legislation that says, man, we're making a mess by the way we're managing deer and deer don't know about state boundaries, and so they can you know, be dining in Ohio and move into Pennsylvania, or be dining in Pennsylvania and move into West Virginia. So I think that we really need to think about more holistic ways of managing um, deer and other ungulates, and um, you, can, you can make your views known, get involved in politics, get involved in uh, you know, local conservation efforts because it's really anything you can do locally will manifest. Yes? Just wondering, I had heard about other species and efforts to uh, get birth control. Is that kind of what is going on here with the deer? There are lots of studies where people have, have tried to do either um, darting the females for birth control, so they basically inject them with a, some kind of birth control, or um, there was even a study at Cornell University where they would, they had tricked out a ambulance where they would dart females and then put them in the ambulance and take them in and do surgery to sterilize the females and let them back out, and it was like you know, $5,000 per deer, and it's, you know, still, it was like, you know, deer in people's front yards, and it wasn't really helping. It's too expensive, it's too time-consuming. It's really something that, uh, it's just, the system is out of balance, and there's probably the easiest way to get it back in balance is to not be afraid of coyotes. You know, keep your cats inside, they're eating the birds anyway, you know, so. <laughs> Um, uh, and for restoration, once habitats become degraded or invaded, there are ways of controlling invaders, um, assessment of the native status and who's there and you know, whether, whether it's a place that can be restored. Uh, when you have these kinds of mycorrhizal uh, losses, you can re-inoculate soil so that there is um, a population of AMF and EMF and other beneficial fungi that's available to re-inoculate the plants. And there's also some work that's being done in the um, Rocky Mountains in the West where they do rotational grazing. People graze their cattle up in the mountains and they have big fenced areas and they fence it off for two years, the plants recover, and then they move the fence. And so you don't have this permanent um, structure, but it's moving around so that it sort of averages it out more like what it used to be in terms of, of pressure. And what else? Yeah, and the other thing is like, you know, I love gardening. Everyone has invasive, you know, non-native plants in their garden practically. Um, and so I think it's hard to uh, know who our next invader will be or what the next um, species that might cause this kind of problem like we're seeing in the, in the forest. I mean, garlic mustard was introduced as a kitchen herb in New York, you know, that it was brought from Europe. It tastes like garlic and mustard. You grind it up, people make pesto out of it. It's, you know, it's tasty, it's not its fault that it's here. We brought it here to eat and then it got away. So I think that we need to have uh, maybe 
develop more tools for evaluating species and, and not um, just allowing it all to happen. So I want to end with a plug for all you nature lovers <laughs> that um, the spring wildflower pilgrimage is something that uh, my department and lots of other departments on campus participate in. It's a three-day event, um, April 24th through 27th this year where uh, naturalists and specialists of all kinds who know the trees, the understory, the mosses, the salamanders, the birds, the mammals, the water, you know, you name it, uh, the fishes, you can go on hikes with them in um, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and it's an amazing time. It's just a really an amazing time and I urge you if you haven't been to go the registration opens tomorrow. I, I went to the, the link this morning and I kept going, is that really tomorrow? I kept trying to make it open. It's tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know why March 2nd instead of March 1st. But here's the link if you want to take a picture with your phone. Um, and I think. Susan, can we get the input? How many of y'all raise your hand if you've ever been to the Spring Wildfire Pilgrimage? Have any of you been? Boy, for nature lovers, you need you know, and your <laughs> Last year, I think there were like 800 people from all over the world. People come from all over the world to and, see and it. It's about 100 volunteers, uh, some of our botany PhDs yeah. in the past and whatnot that, uh, yeah. that come and give the walk stalks and hikes and whatnot. Right, so yeah, and on all kinds of flora and fauna. Um, and it's really fun, and you just hike around and get to see beautiful things. So uh, I recommend going if you haven't gone. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty nice. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.